that hosts tonight's programming in collaboration with Tulane University and extend a very warm welcome to our esteemed guest, Maurice Cox. Thank you so much for joining us. As part of our 3C series, we aim to foster a relaxed, lounge-like atmosphere, providing an informal platform for learning. This evening's program is, an accredited, uh, is accredited for one HSW, Health Safety and Welfare, credit. If you're an AIA member, please be sure to see Ty, our operations manager, make sure she, she has your AIA number. We commence the evening with a brief introduction from our presenting sponsor, KB Workspace. Their generosity has transformed our space and provided the comfortable lounge furniture that we are enjoying tonight. KB Workspace is a valued professional affiliate for AIA New Orleans, and we are, a very, we are very proud of our partnership. I am pleased to introduce Marie Richaud, and uh, who is the business develop business development manager, and Chris Bendirdoff, yes, yeah. principal and owner of KB Workspace. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, I'm Marie Rishu. I'm a and business development with KB Workspace, and then here's Chris Bendirdoff this evening, <clears throat> and she is our principal and owner of our company. Yeah, so thank you all, and uh, thanks AIA for the opportunity to be a part of this great event. Uh, we're just going to do a little intro yeah. and get to the launch on the website. So we're going to bring it up and show you guys real quick. We've just got a, few, just a couple minutes. Yeah. Uh, it talks a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, so, again, <coughs> brand new launch website. Well, I'm probably one of the first groups of people to actually. We're very excited about it. We're going to Yes. So, we are the yeah. North dealer in Louisiana. So products, furniture, walls, that is our niche where we play in the market. A little bit about on the website that we show. Um, it, again, talks a little bit about who we are, some of our por portfolio uh, products, how we work on this first little page. Yeah, and then um, I'll go over here too. Yeah. So portfolio, if you, if you do go to our website and we have some different brochures and different QR codes, if you would like to see our site, you can uh, check us out. Uh, but on our website, we do have some projects, recent projects, different right. photographs of the different jobs that we do, um, just to, and where we play in the market. So, yeah, vertical market, corporate, government, healthcare, education, uh, all your primary vertical markets in the corporate world. And services, so from space planning, we work very hand in hand with architects, designers to develop specifications for products. Uh, we have our own installers, warehouse. Etc. Financing for projects and just a full complement of services. And then we're just going to go through this real yeah, and super we have quick. One slide here, the designer tools, Chris. Just a good one. Yeah, and wanted to point out we specifically on our website because we do so much work with uh, interior designers and architects. We put a designer tool link. So for Revit symbols and uh, tools where you can specify, there's some great like deep, uh, paper has like a DYO tool where you can specify a chair, some simple products yourself. Yep. Just to get the access. Yeah. Material Bank, a link to Material Bank, and then we also have a link to all of our partner companies, so Hayworth, and then all all the other companies that we do business with. So these are active live links. So if you need, you know, you're looking for a product, you can certainly call us. But if you're looking for a manufacturer, sometimes, you know, since nobody has libraries really anymore, you know, we're you know hoping this could be like a go-to tool to kind of help help you So and then our contact info on the last page too. Um, whenever you have time, if you want to look at it. Here's where you can reach us directly. We got our maps, our showroom for New Orleans is actually right next door um, in the Patrick Taylor Foundation building. Yeah, it's attached. It's, it's literally attached to this building. Yeah. So y'all can come visit us there. And then we have an, our headquarters location on the North Shore as well. But if you go to our showroom right now, it's empty because all the products. It's <laughs> literally here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're sitting in it. Yeah. So yeah, so that's just a little bit, a little barb about us. So thank so, y'all so much. Nice. Yeah. Thank you so much. We are deeply grateful for all of your incredible support of our events throughout the year. So thank you so much. Yeah. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Kenneth Schwartz, our moderator for this evening. Kenneth holds the position of founding director at the Phyllis Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking. Serves as a professor and former dean of um, at the Tulane University School of Architecture and occupies the Michael Sachs Chair of Civic Engagement and Social Entrepreneurship. He was honored with fellowship of the American Institute of Architects in 2001, reflecting his significant contributions of the field, to the field. 
Kenneth earned his Master of Architecture and Urban Design degree and Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell University. His accolades include the prestigious Alumni Association Distinguished Professor Award in 2003, recognizing his remarkable achievements during his tenure at the University of Virginia, where he served as the Architecture Department Chair and Associate Dean for the School of Architecture for 24 years. As a founding principal of CPND Community Planning and Design and Schwartz Canard Architects, he garnered success in four national design competitions, showcasing the transformative impact of progressive urbanism and architecture and city revitalization efforts. Kenneth's accomplishments are extensive and his expertise is unparalleled. We are privileged to have him introduce tonight's speaker. Please join me in welcoming Kenneth Schwartz. Well, thank you for those kind words. And it's great to be here. Is all doing okay with the absolutely optimistic APAC system? <laughs> I'm actually going to start with a, a land acknowledgement that we use at the Taylor section, and actually other parts of the Bay University use the same language acknowledging uh, the history of this place. and other native peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. Our identities are inextricably connected to this place. Gratitude and honor, we pay tribute to the official inhabitants of this land. The city of the Midwest is not built upon Virginia's original soil, but merely serves as a continuation of the great indigenous trade hub known as Choctaw or Vermonta, the place of other tongues. For thousands of years, people lived along the Mississippi River. And Pasha served as a place for diverse cultures to come together. We acknowledge the grounds of our campus, the Bay University, and the city around us as home to numerous tribes before and after the arrival of Europeans. The division of community and sharing demonstrated by indigenous peoples enabled European immigrants to survive in a foreign environment and has influenced New Orleans and Southeastern culture since colonization began from food and music to art and language, Native Americans continue to leave their mark on our city and academic community. We recognize that as a result of broken treaties and involuntary removals, Native Americans were often forced from their lands. We remember and pay respect to the communities impacted by these actions. Yet the resilient voices of Native Americans are still heard and remain an inseparable part of our local culture. In that spirit, we acknowledge the indigenous nations that have lived and continue to live here. It reminds us of the importance of our past and the people who have occupied the past and made this place possible. So, my real purpose here is to welcome my dear friend and colleague and to introduce Maurice Cox to all of you. And I must say that it's always wonderful to be together with Maurice, whether it's in Detroit, Chicago. Charlottesville, or most importantly, New Orleans, when he served here in his role as associate dean of community engagement and the director of the Small Center for Collaborative Design. But I would also say that it is an absolutely perfect time to celebrate Maurice. It's an auspicious time, and you would say it's, um, I don't know, an audacious time is the way that you say it too late. That audacious word appears a lot. <laughs> And the reason I'm saying that, and I'm going to use this as part of my introduction, is that he's had a double header over the course of this past year. Not only has he been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and if you don't know that honor, a couple of the people who joined this this year are Francis Ford Coppola, Meryl Elam from Atlanta, incredible architect, Michael Balson, an incredible architect from Los Angeles, and my favorite actress, Francis McCormick. And he received this honor as one of the two amazing achievements and recognitions in the past year. The second one is uh, an award he received, which I think comes as a surprise. I don't think it's something that the recipient really knows is happening in the background. But it's called the Henry Holt Mead Award. It's, it's uh, provided by the University of Notre Dame to a generous donor. And I want to read you a little bit about the recognition that he received on this count. His expertise uh, in the first award of this year's prize in honor of Dr.'s efforts to address social and economic inequity by means of well informed policy and design. His contributions to meditation and the importance of preserving the social and built fabric of communities 
and this remarkable commitment to public service. He is a citizen architect, a leader, who has brought design into the center of conversations everywhere he's been. And quoting from the chair of the, of the committee that selected him to participate on, the dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame, I quote, his expertise working across political appointments, leadership positions in education, private practice, and elected roles over the course of a long and varied career is an example of how civic engagement and attention to design can directly improve the lives of each and every member of the community. These are values that Maurice has lived and practiced in his life. And I've known that life since 1993, since we brought him to the University of Virginia as an assistant professor of architecture, he proceeded to tenure, to becoming mayor of the city of Charlottesville, to moving back to New Orleans, moving to New Orleans in 2013, and then his career only took off when he went to Detroit as a planning director and Chicago writer and book. This is an extraordinary life. I don't think you can hear parts of this in this presentation in a moment. So the accolades are that that, that accrued over that process is amazing. And he's repeatedly put himself in places where the challenges seem the greatest and has left behind a solid foundation that others can build upon. And once again, design is at the center of his thinking, of his practice, of his evangelical work in communities, and the way in which he's been so successful in making great things happen. So Maurice, we are delighted to have you back in New Orleans. We wish you'd stay here, but I, I know we've got other places to be <laughs> So with that, I am uh, very happy to welcome my friend, Maurice Cox. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you, uh, Ken, for you know such a, a warm, warm welcome. It's not it's not often that your best friend gets to introduce you, <laughs> so it feels uh, that really uh, wonderful. He's been uh, a mentor. I mean, what he didn't say is that in every step of that career, he has had something to do with it uh, uh, in terms of his uh, expert uh, guidance and really acting as a model for me. Uh, in, in so many ways. So uh, it feels like a, a welcome home. Oh my, right in the front row, I just keep seeing people who are part of that, uh, part of this long journey that I've been on. Uh, so it feels great to be back. The weather is fine. <laughs> I put away my winter coat when I came uh, from Chicago. And um, and I, I thought I would um, try to, I'm gonna move hopefully quickly through um, some notes that I have on various places that have helped shape me, uh, starting uh, really with New Orleans uh, and, uh, and how that has impacted how I view the work in Detroit and, and Chicago. And then I hope that, you know, it'll stimulate questions um, in conversation. Uh, now, first thing is, let me see how this mouse thing works. It's kind of cute. Wow. Really kind of All right. Um, so I have uh, been a lover of cities and focus a lot of my attention on those areas of cities that are understood to be the heart of the city, you know, the, the downtowns, the, the, the waterfronts. Um, and in many ways, it, it, it makes sense. So it's, it's, belongs to everyone. Um, <clears throat> but I really uh, have begun to understand, uh, largely from the work that I've done with communities, that there's also a soul of, of a city. Uh, and um, that soul resides in cities and neighborhoods. And I actually think that that is the um, laboratory for uh, innovation. Uh, and so I have spent time in both the heart and soul of the cities, a lot of the work that I've been called on is to give attention to the um, soul. And uh, as many of you know, I had this crazy idea that I could be an elected uh, leader of a, of a beautiful um, city, uh, Charlottesville. Uh, but I came to that role as an organizer, as someone who really just wanted to uh, advocate for the neighborhood I lived in, which was a beautiful historic neighborhood that was not um, not protected. Uh, 
Uh, and so I started working with my residents, started asking pointed questions, generally to political leaders as to how, how is it that a neighborhood like this that is 98% African-American is not protected. Uh, and I, um, together with my neighbors, we got uh, Rich Street designated the first um, African-American neighborhood on the south side of the tracks to be so designated. Uh, so when I was going through all this work, I, I began to understand um, trying to get people to, to move or to embrace innovation is a really challenging task. And in effect, what we're often doing when we ask communities to change in a positive way is we're asking them to confront an adaptive challenge. This is a term of art that uh, Ronald Hunt's, uh coined, and that's when you're looking at a problem where the gap between a community's values and uh, their current reality simply cannot be closed with routine activity. And in fact, the work that we ask communities to do is adaptive work. And that requires kind of new learning on the part of all constituents. And so when you start thinking about the fact that all of that resistance that we find to innovation has to do with the fact that we're asking people genuinely to close that gap between their current reality and their values. Um, so this has helped me in many, many ways to kind of craft uh, some principles that I believe. And it starts with this simple notion that every citizen has a right uh, to live in a socially, economically, environmentally well-designed community. Uh, and that effectively uh, the process is a democratic process where you're asking folks to tackle um, really tough challenges. And you do that by willingly giving that work back to the people who will be affected by it. And then, um, uh, you know, design according to their values, uh, not ours, not our disciplines. And that's a, that's a tall order, <laughs> but I've had um, opportunities um, to practice that. And you know, starting with uh, when Ken uh, brought me to uh, New Orleans to head the, what is now the small center. Um, and uh, this notion of university partnership with community um, through small projects that help communities um, adapt and change. Uh, and particularly bringing the resources of faculty, incredibly talented faculty, uh, of resident staff, some of whom are here today, uh, and uh, Nick, um, that help uh, create the framework by which uh, faculty and students can contribute to the changing of um, the built and natural environment. And so actually, uh, these small projects, that stuck with me. Uh, this notion of incremental change and building capacity for people to take on bigger uh, um, challenges. Um, Ken also had me in the role of associate dean community engagement. And there was a specific directive there. He wanted to leverage all of the disciplines, uh, a real estate program, um, preservation program, of course, architecture, and even allied uh, disciplines like landscape architecture, with LSU and, you know, we really for the first time brought all of these disciplines to, to bear on really challenging questions uh, in New Orleans. And so it was a cross-disciplinary way of working um, that has stayed with me uh, and I built my teams with that same notion in mind. The other uh, thing he asked me to do was to try to integrate into the core curriculum uh, things that will authentically uh, New Orleans. Um, and imagine the Mardi Gras Indians uh, allowing students to analyze, um, handle, reinterpret these suits as a part of what it means to go to school in New Orleans. Uh, and this um, collaboration wasn't just uh, one way. Uh, the students got enormous um, benefit out of that, uh, but so did the Mardi Gras Indians. Uh, and uh, one of the partnerships that I was 
most um, that stayed with me uh, and affected me deeply was our partnership with the um, New Orleans Mardi Gras Indian Council. Uh, and specifically at this time, uh, Chief Miller was the head of it. And they, uh, as many of you know, were trying uh, to understand their role uh, post Katrina, how they could preserve the culture, how they could anchor themselves and actually be a driver for economic development. And so that was the task that they brought to the small center. And um, it was about discovering that these gentlemen were uh, preservationists uh, and they, they were preservationists of culture. Uh, and our job was to give them um, a kind of physical manifestation of how that culture could be, uh, be housed. And uh, we worked to create the largest uh, video archive of their, their stories. And we uh, came up with a, a framework by which they could create a campus uh, at their place, their home place, A.L. Davis Park. Um, so we worked with these gentlemen. They are at the small center. And they are entrepreneurs, they're cultural leaders. Um, and, you know, you think about the hundreds of years of masking that this represents and the ability for them to, to direct an entire corridor as a cultural corridor. So they um, identified LaSalle Street as a cultural corridor. And uh, these were one of our walk shops where we would literally go down the block and identify properties uh, and what they might need to anchor a kind of cultural district. And we, we landed, uh, we got to this block <clears throat> right in front of Hale Davis Park. Um, they said, this will be the heart of our campus. <clears throat> and so our job um, as facilitators <clears throat> was to try to help them understand how do you put together financial um, proposal that is able to attract investments uh, and um, claim this, to culturally tag uh, this block as theirs. Uh, <clears throat> and so um, we helped them secure a $500,000 grant. Um, the Foundation for Louisiana was a part of it and Art Place America was a part of it. And it took a long time, uh, but some of you may remember uh, in uh, February of 2020, they took possession uh, of these two buildings that were re completely renovated as their uh, permanent museum, uh, educational center. And so the work that was precarious, precariously housed in a um, you know, multi-purpose youth center across the street is now um, the center of their campus. And so, <clears throat> Um, I, I felt these are men who were transitioning to being entrepreneurs, community developers that are able to, to direct the, the future of what that corridor uh, is becoming. And this is um, an example of what has happened, quite frankly, since them uh, claiming that. This uh, diagram, I was enamored with this, this is from a student in uh, Byron Mouton's uh, studio where they were doing a, a Saturday market, uh, but they talked about what it meant to string together um, like charms on a, a bracelet, uh, incremental interventions that over time could solidify this corridor. And so this was the first time that their studio did a non-house project. And that was also a part of the agenda to try to expand the scope of Urbanville um, to create uh, a market. And then um, right next door to that is uh, Yaya Art Center that is developed, uh, Byron uh, developed this, where you have kind of uh, arts education for youth, adults, and then the do drop in. Um, and this project is quite dear to uh, uh, my heart as well because, uh, again, it gets back to this whole notion of cultural preservation 
and what it means to take and bring a renowned uh, jazz organization and bring it back to life. And it talks about the power of an of a, of a idea, of a, of a diagram that really went dormant for a while until it found the right um, development partner. But it was, again, bringing ordinary people who had a vision and bringing them, uh, helping them become the community developers that are, are, that are embedded in so many of us. Uh, and so uh, my wife, Giovanna, Gafione uh, was the design lead. And at the time, because this was going to be heavy lift, all we could do was try to get this building off of the blight list and help people understand what phenomenal things happen within that building. And so uh, a tactical strategy of just uh, taking these archival photographs that we found and plastering them on the building as a preservation strategy. Um, this is it during its uh, heyday, and I'm sure uh, this is the architect's vision of it completely restored, and this is it uh, today. So one of the things I want to do while I'm here is to go to the drop there. <laughs> um, and again, uh, that the idea of the programmatic uh, outline that we created of uh, a hotel, bringing back the barber, a place to dine, and uh, a supper club is the program that uh, a very talented developer found uh, and has brought, uh, brought into fruition. So from my perspective, this started with the Mardi Gras Indians claiming LaSalle Street as a cultural core. And it's, it wasn't a big master plan a series of incremental steps uh, that I think will continue to grow. And I feel that the genesis of that are, um, are these um, and laid the cornerstone for that strategy. So, um, so that way of working has stayed with me and it has permeated all of the portfolio in Detroit and Chicago. But I've always been interested in how you go beyond just including people, giving them an ownership stake, uh, allowing them to drive the planning process. Uh, and we all know that's really, really difficult. But uh, I had the good fortune um, to have a city, uh, one of America's renowned cities, uh, as a laboratory to explore what it means to, have, to create a, a community-driven vision and to defy all of the stereotypes of what Detroit had become in the public consciousness. Um, the idea uh, of talking about Detroit and beauty is something that we did constantly, because Detroit is an absolutely beautiful city. It has one of the finest collections of early 20th century high rises anywhere to be found outside of New York, Chicago. Um, but it also is a city that is kind of regenerating before our very eyes. Um, you know, this is just a, a mile from uh, the center of downtown. And it has two extraordinary assets. One is historic buildings by the thousands uh, and land. Uh, and it is really, really, really big. Uh, my friend uh, Dan Becerra at New Mercy um, popularized this map just to help people understand just how big uh, a geography Detroit is. Uh, three, uh, Boston, San Francisco, and the island of Manhattan. And the amount of publicly owned land that's in the land bank is the size of the island of Manhattan itself. And so the question is like, what do you do with that kind of resource, particularly when it's handed down to you like this. Yeah, it's not a big central park. Uh, it's a speckled um, tapestry of vacancy and occupancy, uh, all within walking distance of each other. So this was the laboratory. Um, but we had to start with a kind of unified vision of the city as it um, faces the Detroit River. 
Uh, and how do you create a long-term vision uh, for a city that has really no development pressure? Uh, where do you start? What's the driver? Um, well, the driver in uh, the case of Detroit, and Detroit has been working on this now for over 15 years, um, was the riverfront, a series of publicly um, accessible uh, spaces, um, promenades along the Detroit River that kind of culminated at the Renaissance. And it has generated probably one of the most diverse riverfronts I've ever seen. Um, it is the only five mile stretch uh, that you can access the river. Uh, in the region, uh, so everyone comes to this place. Um, but the challenge was to try to get Detroiters to think um, long term, so that we could decide where things go uh, to make sure that the public um, realm is prized over private interests. We worked um, with SOM on this plan. And it um, really tested um, the whole engagement process. Are, are we willing to listen to residents as they speak to us about something as valuable and beloved as the riverfront? And then, you know, the challenge here is uh, this is the resource. The resource is land. Uh, I said there's no development pressure, per se. And even to this day, uh, no new buildings have been done on this site. Um, so how do you create a vision of what's possible um, using landscape uh, as the driver? Uh, and this uh, was proposed by Michel Dubin, um, a, a French landscape architect that brought um, the creeks and the riverbeds um, from Detroit coming to the Detroit River as the signature identity for um, a, a riverfront park, a central park. And it was really important um, to claim this space as public um, and to find a way to talk to Detroiters about still accommodating the density, but that density is at the service of finding this great central park. And um, before this plan, condominiums were being built right up to the riverfront. And, and no one thought uh, that it would be possible to accommodate them and give this riverfront um, back to Detroiters. So here's the challenge. Uh, and there were many, many, many people uh, in that process who said, you know, it's great to have a, uh, a, a world-class riverfront, but if I can't get to it, if I have to cross a nine-lane highway to get to the riverfront, it's like not having it at all. So one of the first things we did um, was to take this nine lane highway and put it on a diet and reduce it to five lanes uh, with protected bike lanes and on street parking. Uh, and I don't know how I convinced the mayor <laughs> to let me do this because all hell broke loose in the suburbs, people <laughs> wanting to get to their downtown. But we did it uh, even though there wasn't um, an extraordinary demand, but all of a sudden people were coming out riding on something that was once nine lanes um, with their kids um, using this. And it it turns out still to this day, this is the longest stretch of uninterrupted protected bike lanes in the country. And we did this with a matter of months and we did it to talk to the people across the highway uh, to let them know that this belonged to them. And so um, so it's interesting that the big investments um, happen off of the riverfront. So this is what, once you pass the housing, which is Section 8 affordable housing, this is what greeted you to try to get to cross the nine lane highway. And so once again, our biggest, our first investment was to change the reality of how people access this world-class world. -class world. Um, and so that's the same uh, plaza. There are shops, a bakery, coffee house um, in that. And um, 
we drove that greenway system for several miles through the neighborhood. So, you know, you think about a big downtown riverfront plan, and then you see the first million being spent in the neighborhoods. That was the goal, to show that the heart and the soul of these cities uh, needed each other. Um, and, um, and I write this all the time when I, when I go back to Detroit. The other was trying to take this theory of landscape urbanism and see what it, how it played out when you have actual residents living in these areas. So all the area you see here in blue is vacant land. So it's the connective tissue of the areas you see in yellow, which are the more stable, established neighborhoods. So we decided to work on those, to work on them simultaneously. Um, but we were gonna try to make uh, use of this vacant land as a resource. So there are two sides of this. First is how do you create a growth strategy? How do you stabilize the areas where people live? Uh, and we identify 10 uh, geographies across Detroit. You've noticed how many of them touch the borders of Detroit, so they are miles away downtown. Uh, and we worked um, over the course of several years to try to create these uh, urban villages, um, 15, 20 minute neighborhoods where you can get all of your uh, daily needs within a walk from your house. Uh, and we um, authored uh, a study, a framework for the growth of these neighborhoods, each one authored by someone in my planning department with a national leader. Um, but they took about 18 months and they covered um, tangible ways to grow uh, and grow these neighborhoods. And this involved a lot of upfront work on the part of our team that was comprised of urban designers, architects, landscape architects, preservationists, um, to try to define what is a walkable geography in Detroit. You know, we started with a square mile strategy, and then we went to half mile, and finally got to a quarter square mile strategy. Uh, so you can actually walk a quarter square mile, um, and each of those Square miles would have a, a, a main street that would be the, and would have a series of parks. And, you know, there are not a lot of landscape architects in uh, Detroit. Uh, the Smith Group is uh, uh, probably the most well known. Uh, so we decided to call on landscape architects from around the country and around the world, really, to help us author these quarter square mile strategies. Um, one is um, this is Massa, uh, who is also based here in New Orleans, um, and um, you're you're seeing just a, a summary of the types of strategies that we employed uh, at the Chicago Architecture Biennial, uh, and they were um, really thought to be typologies, uh, each one very different. Um, the one that Stackman Massa Michaels authored was the homes and garden strategy. Renovate 100 homes in a square mile and plant 400 flowering meadows. Um, the linear stormwater gardens in the Eastern Market, the form-based code, which is one of the few that relied on building, it was adjacent to downtown. And um, it goes on. Another was based, uh, the one that Walter Hood authored um, was based on a tree nursery, tree nursery in a neighborhood, commercial uh, community-owned nursery. Uh, one uh, by the parks, you, you get the idea that we are just trying to make neighborhoods the, the laboratories of innovation um, with these strategies. The other part, uh, and this is really um, coming from my, my experience of working both in academia and in the profession, uh, we forged a five-year partnership with the University of Michigan to have their students, 150 students, uh, just before they do their thesis, dedicate um, the studio to housing, rehousing Detroit. 
And what was interesting about that, because it was student work, is it gave us a portfolio that literally was rethinking how we live in the 21st century in an area that is land rich, very specific problem. And that we were able to then use to, to get developers to think differently about what housing in Detroit meant, what we could offer. And what you're seeing here is um, Brush Park, which is about 400 uh, units, a block and a half, five different typologies, uh, everything from a $200,000 home sitting on the same lot as an $800,000 home, um, senior housing, 30% uh, affordable in the entire um, neighborhood. Uh, and you know what was interesting for me about this is I wanted to see, could you build a neighborhood as if it were built incrementally, as if it was built over time? Um, how, do you, how do you get that feel of the pattern uh, that we come to understand our neighborhoods are made of? How does that happen? Uh, and we passed the first form-based code for Detroit. And so the entire neighborhood um, has this uh, built-in type, uh, typological variety. Uh, and uh, there are easily another 500 units offered by different developers, different architects happening in the same neighborhood. Um, so the other part of this was like, well, how do you bring it all together? Um, Detroit is known for its radial uh, boulevards. Uh, and our thought was as long as we're dependent on the streets, uh, it's going to be very difficult to create uh, any kind of equity and mobility uh, when, you know, 30%, 35% uh, of traders don't own a car. And so I wondered, could we um, create a greenway system that had um, bike and pedestrian as the organizing structure for the city that would tie, uh, in this case, 23 neighborhoods together? And that Greenway would go through the areas that had been redlined. Um, the areas in yellow and, and pink here were the areas that uh, were denied investment. And so purposefully would go through this area um, where the city, where the land bank owned significant parcels. Uh, and it would um, create, again, a kind of uh, charm or bracelet uh, tying these 23 neighbors together and each of them would have a framework plan so we know how they will grow over time. Um, Detroit is so big that it needs three greenways in order to really capture all neighborhoods. So there's the Iron Bell Trail uh, to the east, uh, and then there's River Rouge on the west, and the Joe Lewis Greenway um, uh, operating in the center. So this is the big remapping of the city according to Greenways. Uh, and then there's a whole network of on-street protected bike lanes that knit the city together. And I had the advantage that, that Detroit had uh, this Quinter Cut, uh, this experiment of uh, transforming this old rail bed that ends in Detroit River. I, I uh, would wage that people would be willing to, to build uh, to live near a greenway just as much as they might um, a transport. Uh, and this was this was the bet. Uh, and we also realized that we would be able to bring neighborhoods and groups of people that historically were not connected uh, into relationship to each other. Um, so you know the, the uh, Bangladeshi community, uh, to a large African-American community, to Hamtramck, another locality, uh, to um, uh, the Irish community. And we were going to do it the Detroit way. Uh, there was a very strong uh, ethic, um, sense of identity in Detroit, and we wanted to put that at the forefront of our thinking. So there were literally hundreds of meetings um, in neighborhoods, trying to understand um, how this would work for the Detroiters who stayed. And what you're seeing here are some of the um, renderings um, 
and you can see the swab. That's about 150 feet wide. And so it just radically changes the portion of public space, the private space with this greenway. And at, at each entrance of the greenway is kind of a major um, gateway park moment. Um, and it is under construction uh, as we speak. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just dramatic to have to not have to go to the Detroit Riverfront to promenade in your neighborhood, but to go into your backyard to find this type of linear park. It will go for 27 miles. Um, and it is, um, it's been so incredibly popular that before they could even get the planting in, <laughs> before, <laughs> before the grass could even grow, people were on it. Um, and it's just changed people's perception of their access to nature. Um, and uh, they're now, um, once again, didn't start near the run, uh, riverfront, started miles away from downtown. Uh, it will take about five years to complete, and it's, uh, it's about $250 million. So, so that, who owns the street? How do we, in the Motor City, shift the equation to pedestrians um, was something that I um I really was constantly confronted with. How do I, you know, when there aren't a lot of cyclists yet, or when uh, the roads are seen to only be for vehicles, how do you get a community to co feel comfortable about it? And this is where the more tactical urbanism strategy was so incredibly helpful. Some of these smaller test cases that I think we learned here um, to do so well at the small center became our way of testing really radical ideas, like taking this four lane um, with a highway median down the middle with eight fifths wide sidewalks and change the equation of who has control of the street. And this is um, the proposal um, authored by Swap Stack and Moss and Michaels together with Alexa Bush to create 24 foot wide sidewalks in a neighborhood that's seven miles from downtown um, on the Livinor corridor. And, um, you know, I would, I would tell you hundreds of meetings, uh, <laughs> but this is what it was before uh, your typical street. This is what it is now. Um, 24, 24, and then the, the right of way. And what's been amazing is to see what kind of community life has emerged by having these downtown scale sidewalks, you know, uh, bicycle uh, paths on a uh, raise, uh, and just commerce, cafe life, just civic life emerging from just shifting the equation. Um, and so um, whether it's bicycle or whether it's pedestrian, the task is really to change the conversation, to use public policy uh, to do that. Um, so, you know, I have really been interested in how you use ordinances, how you use public policy to reframe a city's trajectory. Uh, and I'm going to shift to Chicago and talk a little bit, because I was given enormous uh, latitude with uh, a reformer mayor, Mayor Lightfoot, um, who um, had the courage to appoint a commissioner who was not from Chicago. It was the first time that that's happened. So she wanted someone to come in and shift uh, the attention uh, to, to areas that have been totally underutilized areas of the south and west side of Chicago. Many of you know that's where black and brown people live. Um, you can see what public policy over the past 50 years has done, um, where the northern part of the city has grown wealthier, um, more educated and whiter, and the middle class has all but been pushed out. Uh, Detroit, I mean, Chicago has lost 300,000 African-Americans 
for the past 20 years who moved out to the suburbs. And she was saying, you know, we have to tackle this. We have to tackle it in a long-term view as well as actionable items. So we undertook the first comprehensive plan process in Chicago in 50 years. Uh, and we landed on these two uh, defining principles, equity and resiliency. We were going to see our city through that lens. Um, and um, what that looks like in Chicago is, so on the, on the left, you'll see vibrant commercial corridors, main streets, um, full of people on sidewalks. And uh, on the south and west side, you see boarded up buildings, gates, empty lots. Uh, this is what I was handed to work with. Uh, and she felt really strongly that we needed to forge a partnership with the public sector, private sector, the philanthropic sector, uh, and <clears throat> wanted to do this in a way that public resources were leveraged to, to bring up uh, uh, the private sector on board. Uh, but how we wanted them to come on board was going to be very different than they traditionally uh, might have uh, been. So we crunched a lot of data points, um, proximity to transit, um, number of business licenses, number of pedestrians, um, <clears throat> available land. Uh, and we found these 10 neighborhoods that we thought this strategy of revitalizing the main streets of these neighborhoods could work. Um, and and um, it, it, the program is called Invest Southwest. And here, here I think you'll see uh, where the lessons of New Orleans comes back. Uh, that diagram of LaSalle Street, the idea that you could revitalize the corridor by incremental uh, scattered um, the lot development that still was in a walkable distance became uh, our kind of mantra. And so we, we are our, our, uh, uh, AIA um, committee pro bono worked with communities to imagine what was possible with these infill strategies on these 10 corridors. And we were doing all this during COVID um, and uh, digitally. Uh, but before COVID, we had um, a series of community meetings where we asked the community, where should we start? What are the buildings that you love in your neighborhood? Uh, and we got all kinds of input. We took that input and framed a series of requests for proposals. And again, the demographics were such um, <clears throat> that the private sector was not coming. This is not where they felt they could make a return on their investment. So we had to figure out a way uh, to bring them to the table. Um, and the, the things that the community was saying, uh, this idea of the 15 minute neighborhood, they wanted uh, affordable mixed use housing with animated um, street light on their um, main streets. They wanted full suite of amenities from dining, the family to uh, to uh, fine dining. So they wanted all of the storefronts filled. Um, they wanted a recreational amenity, a uh, significant one. And then uh, interesting and you know, uh, maybe uh, goes without saying, uh, COVID, they wanted public health access within their neighborhood. So this was literally getting the private sector hospitals to join us um, on this corridor strategy. Uh, and Northwestern is now building their um, first um, healthcare facility on the South Side in Bronzeville. Uh, Bronzeville Winery was made possible by a grant. Um, and what we had anticipated was if we put out these um, request for proposals that were um, driven by community, would other investments come? And this is an example uh, of these multiple um, investments. Two of these were the city-sponsored investment proposals. 
And so all of a sudden we see hundreds of millions of dollars of investment happening on this world. And we did a lot to prepare the community for this change. To, to imagine to take it, uh, do an RFP where the community has already blessed the outcome. Uh, and if you can, um, you can channel the things that the community uh, has asked for, then you will be uh, uh, rewarded. So over the course of three years, we released like 20 RFPs. And they weren't for mega multi-acre sites. These were incremental smaller sites. We put a, a menu of incentives um, together, both for affordable housing and uh, economic development. And um, when the architects knew exactly what um, we were aiming for, should it be six stories tall. Um, and these are just few of the winning uh, mixed use um, infill projects along these commercial corridors. So they range between 25 million and 50 million. They're all um, affordable. They all have locally driven by requirement uh, entrepreneurs um, inhabiting the ground floors. There are no national chains in any of the commerce because community, that's not what they want. Um, and so um, they are currently under construction. The, the, the catalytic impact of those uh, 10 uh, RFPs are about 320 million. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, the the level of public subsidy is easily 40 to 50 percent uh, to make these projects happen. Um, but we were convinced that if we could show that there was value there, that others would come. So, you know, the program is called Invest Southwest, um, a strong emphasis on the public realm. Uh, pedestrian orientation, uh, public space uh, within the property. Um, that was one thing that was driven. Um, the other was amazing program and placemaking of uh, public space, uh, plazas, um, parks, um, quiet spaces, places of commerce. Um, and uh, I had the good fortune of having the small business division in, uh, in my department, and we gave out uh, grants, $250,000 uh, to entrepreneurs uh, for their ideas to how to respond uh, to the amenities that people were asking for. And all of this was, uh, we did marketing studies, we did uh, studies of uh, retail leakage, we could tell the developer exactly what categories of things uh, communities wanted to purchase. And we've seen um, this amazingly successful Brownsville Winery is one. Um, and the strategy, uh, there's a little bit of like Robin Hood going on here. Um, the, there is a density bonus that developers are given for downtown high rises. And that fund is transferred to the neighborhood. Uh, in the form of $250,000 grants. So every time somebody wants a little taller building, I'm counting the number of new stores that are gonna open up on the Southwest side. Um, and so that system and that's policy. So this will go on for um, a long time. And so uh, what was uh, kind of, how did this happen? Um, we were very mindful that we had to prepare the private sector but how we wanted them to show up. Um, the philanthropic community worked with us to design a program to give um, commercial real estate developers and community developers uh, feasibility grants to be able to possibly to participate. And our job, of course, was to create the opportunity and to manage the public process. And the thing that has been amazing about this work is that 60% of this work is being led by uh, black and brown developers. Uh, many of them doing their first big project um, in, their, in their careers in, through this program. And what we've seen, the associations they've made and joint venture partnerships have carried them forward 
uh, and a whole new um, generation of developers are emerging because of this program. Um, if you look at it by the block, there were typologies. Uh, the full block missing gap within a typical uh, commercial corridor was one, um, one typology. Another was um, the creation of new public spaces, corner spaces on vacant lots. This is a program of which we built 10 of these, uh, each different uh, in each community through $500,000 grants. We used actually our, our COVID um, uh, dollars to create this program. Um, and, you know, the level of cooperation it took between the Department of Transportation spilling out into the street, um, the adjacent uh, property owners. Um, and what has been amazing about this investment, this was the first one. Uh, so it was actually done with $200,000. Every store around this space has changed. Um, there's a new coffee shop going up against the mural. Uh, there's another uh, food place across the street. There's a bakery. All of this happened as a result of $250,000 investment that was meant to literally pop as you drove or um, walked by. Um, and then we started looking at uh, medium scale, trying to talk about the corner. You anchor the corner you restore the block. Um, and so a smaller scale corner strategy. And then um, the cluster strategy, when you actually have responsibility for the entire intersection, these are generally made up of two or three buildings uh, by the same development group. Um, and this is another one that's under construction. This is two blocks long, two historic buildings being rehabbed. Uh, new construction mixed with smaller scale infill in a uh, Latino neighborhood. And so, um, you know, incremental projects, audacious results. Um, and I'm channeling the multiple, small center every step of the way, uh, simply taking it to another scale. Uh, you can see this is another corridor and what has happened the part I haven't talked about was the companion piece by the Department of Transportation that's redoing all of the streetscapes. So every one of those streets get a new, wide, um, artist-driven streetscape interpretation. Um, and some of the innovation to, to help us get to a level of architectural quality was the creation of a pre-qualified list of designers. We put out a call for Chicago-based firms um, that would be willing uh, to partner with us uh, and be a ready pool of architects for developers. We couldn't require them to use it, but we could expedite our process if they chose these. And the, the majority of these firms are women-owned firms uh, and other um, and uh, African-American and Latino firms. That are doing extraordinary work, but that but a developer would never choose them without this kind of additional push. Uh, and this notion of constantly engaging uh, citizens, even through COVID, we started creating these virtual town halls. Every month, we met uh, like religion with stakeholders. Those numbers always vary between thirty and sixty people on a Zoom call just listening to the progress of the work in this board. Uh, we've had hundreds of those meetings. And this has been the impact at the, uh, uh, as of uh, last year, uh, it's $1.4 billion of investment. There's another billion dollars uh, on top of that, um, that we've been able to create. Uh, but the main thing was proving, could we catalyze private investment and can we do it with a level of quality uh, that um, is commensurate? So the, I'm going to end on this. So the other part of this work has been, how do you now invite all those people who left to come home, the, who love their neighborhoods, who grew up in these neighborhoods? Um, I um, launched as the next phase of this initiative, 
uh, Come Home initiative, which was to release 2,000 lots that were adjacent to these corridors for a strategy of the missing middle density of housing. Uh, and we wanted to put, we wanted design to be the development driver. So we ran a national competition um, for the new missing middle, the two flats, the three flats, the townhouses, uh, the six flats. Uh, and we invited uh, 40 firms um, to um, participate. All 40 firms participated. Uh, and we had, uh, we sponsored this with the Chicago Architecture Center and a foundation uh, paid for the competition uh, to discover what were the new row houses uh, that could be typical of our neighborhoods. Uh, the two and three flats, so that you have ways to create uh, generational wealth. Uh, and uh, the new six flat. Uh, and what was interesting about this model was these were meant to be replicated. So I was taking a page out of uh, Brush Park and seeing if I could create uh, with a whole lot more existing fabric um, the incremental growth of a neighborhood. And the idea is having smaller scale developers working on six to nine lots cluster and all working in the same neighborhood and using these typologies. Um, and so this is typically how it would work. You have a lot more existing fabric. It's meant to be an infill. The developers would respond to requests for qualifications. They would choose the type that they felt um, they could interpret. Uh, we were very fortunate to get a foundation to pay for all of the working drawings. So the developer is buying the typology. They use six of them, they pay for, for six. They use three, they pay for three. So it's trying to try a different model for the architect. Instead of doing your one six flat, the idea is yes, the six flat is meant to be repeated. And, uh, and so I have to say this too uh, takes, um, taken longer than I had anticipated. We, we're also expediting the process because we're working with the building department uh, to pre-approve uh, the plan. So when the developer buys them, the process is expedited. Uh, and very specifically, this was meant for developers who are working in these neighborhoods. They're doing two flats. They might have done a three flat or renovated and trying to give them a mechanism to find a ladder for the redevelopment. Uh, and it all goes down, you know, goes down the funding. But we are going to have to underwrite uh, the per unit costs to keep these uh, in the realm of affordable uh, housing. And so you can see that uh, the foundation community is contributing. Um, we, the, the city council is looking at a $15 million bond uh, $15 million every year for the next five years to underwrite uh, the program. And so the financial model is a part of this. And here you can see how these new typologies play out uh, in existing things. And so, you know, that's really the other part of the 15 you know, minute neighborhood, how you create a, a truly exciting way to live in these neighborhoods that have never been involved of this way. Okay. Thank you. So much the dark is amazing. Yeah. Um, you can turn on lights. We are uh, happy to entertain questions or comments, and I'm going to take it off just to get something started here. I have a preview of some of this work months ago in the context of a project that's underway. For Maurice to publish a book that is tied to the work that you've just seen this evening. Really, as tied to his legacy as a city planner, as an educator, and many of the many things to what he's brought to bear. So, uh, what the project came to me this evening is that, you know, we were educated, I 
Cooper Union. And an extremely um, formalist basis and really valuable design, in many cases, at the level of abstraction <laughs> and, and um, sort of the beauty of the city of creating something meaningful as a design of a So that was your early formative years. And then you fast forward to many of the things you've talked about this evening having to do with the public realm or public space or the civic life. <laughs> So my question is, um, how do you attribute some of this interest in your duality to your time in Italy? I remember that well. Wow. He literally came and got me. <laughs> Yeah. 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 No, I. You know, I. I, I'm, I suspect I would not be professional. I am had it not been for those ten years in Italy, because you know, I. I had the great fortune of being educated by some extraordinary um, people like John Ada, Bernard Chumi, Rick Scafidio, Peter Eisenman. Uh, Todd Williams, these, it, I mean, it was just, I had no idea at that time. But I also, to be honest with you, when I graduated, I was like, so am I going to go out and get a, a vacation home of a, of a famous writer on the Hamptons? Is, is that who my constituency will be? Uh, I don't think so. Um, and so I was interested in working in neighborhoods like the neighborhoods I've shown you here. That's where I wanted. And the challenge was, you know, the, the, the preconditions are not there to work in the private, in the, in the private, you know, sector. Um, the answer is in the public sector. Uh, that's where resources can be marshaled. That's where our cities have an obligation to invest in. And so I was, I was drawn to uh, the more public side. Uh, and of course, you know, anyone, you know, who's ever, you know, uh, sipped a, a cafe in an Italian piazza knows how important um, that, you know, that space is, that, that, that life is. I, I drank, slept, worked that for 20 years. Uh, I also suspect that my belief in historic preservation um, has a way to, 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 to access people, things that they care about, um, came from those 10 years of living in Italy. Um, so I became a, a very different architect as a result of those 10 years. I will tell you, I also met my first architect who was a planning director in Italy. Uh, he was an amazing architect, Massimo Caramassi. And so I was like, wow, I mean, it made an impression on me that an architect could be a planning director uh, and have domain over the entire city. Uh, I stored that away. Uh, and then when I got the call in 2015 to be a planning director in Detroit, I was like, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> Architects do this. Uh, and I, I went that way. So. Again, I think that experience uh, broadly of um, living abroad, living in another culture uh, that values history and that values publicness um, has filtered into everything I do, uh, for sure. Yes, please. Hi, I, um, thank you for being here. And, um, I wanted to ask you about the foundation and I am a, an urban planner, actually, a retired urban planner, and our planning director. So, oh, and I really appreciate awesome. your perspective as a planning director. Um, and I love that you focus on Ingram Publix because we know that planning space it is so true. Yeah. When you're out there and you can see the the world. Um, I worked, uh, I lived in Boston for a while in the 80s and 90s, okay. sure. and we, we're doing link linkage. We were linking the incredible growth that was going on in right. downtown Boston yep. in, the, in the high demand uh, for affordable redevelopment 
to the neighborhoods. Yeah. And I noticed you were using that approach to Chicago. Yeah. And when I moved back to New Orleans, I was struck with the challenge of, of yeah. yes, when there's not a lot of demand for downtown development, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a, a hot downtown development environment for a long time of decades. Been since the 80s, mm -hmm. oil and gas, you know, plus. Um, and, and how important it is to have that in order to link into the neighborhood. So, have you given any, any, any thought to a city like New Orleans, which, you know, isn't doesn't have a booming downtown, which makes land just impossible, and, and how, to, how to bring resources to yeah. the neighborhoods? That's missing? No, that's, I mean, that's a great question because, uh, I mean, again, the downtowns, many of our American cities are hurting uh, and they're ailing and they are not a, res a resource for uh, a lot of wealth to be transferred. I will tell you uh, that um, this program on the south and west side of Chicago was independent of uh, a downtown Kind of vibrancy. The, the developers who are working in these neighborhoods are not the developers who are working downtown. I mean, uh, some of them are joint venturing, uh, bringing some of the younger emerging developers along. But by and large, this is a new group of people who were there all along, um, working in those environments with no support, uh, no infrastructure. Uh, and when we turned our attention, and the mayor turned their attention to them, um, you know, they, they, they felt seen for the first time. And I will be one work in, in, uh, in Chicago that I don't know if New Orleans has, but they have tax increment finance districts. Um, you know, and they work for me. Chicago has 140 of them. Yeah, they're just over over the top, and uh, you know, you you set that that base, and any increment can then be used for economic development. Uh, the problem is, if you don't have any development, not much increment gets created. Uh, and so we um, so we had to do a mixture of tax increment finance, economic development bonds. Um, we just we recommended a, a one point two five billion dollar uh, bond. Um, for housing and economic development now. Uh, so I think each city uses its own tools and each city sizes uh, the investment according to their resource. One thing I had noticed is that, you know, we have these uh, neighborhoods, they already have the infrastructure in place. They have the transit often, they have um, the streets. So you don't have to go subsidize all of this new infrastructure to do um, development, you can actually build off of uh, those assets that you have. Um, so I, I don't think it's either or. Uh, I think you can have a vibrant uh, neighborhood strategy. I, you, you know, of course, um, you need both. Um, so I, I hear you. I mean, I appreciate the question because I'm, mean, you know, I, you know, reality even in Detroit was. Um, you know, the downtown has taken off, but the work that I showed you was miles from downtown. Uh, and there were interesting linkage, linkages that were made there. Uh, one of the more interesting ones, because Detroit doesn't have a tax increment finance structure, was to get downtown corporate uh, leaders to contribute to a neighborhood strategic fund. And not just the ubiquitous big pot, it was, Livinois, Nichols, we want you to contribute with philanthropy and with the public sector to create that pot. And we we got easily 10 leading corporations of downtown that otherwise were just doing kind of good deeds uh, to actually contribute uh, resources. So I think, you know, you can tailor interesting models. Thank you, um, I can take the I guess the last question. We have a number of students here and also emerging professionals. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about how you put your teams together or mm -hmm. 
you have many aspects of your legacy. One is as educator. There's also a part of your, your persona as someone who's hired people at what various levels. So mm -hmm. recently I've schooled with people who are fully developed and even naturally prominent people students. So well, my question is, what are the qualities that you see in people who are attracted to work with you and work as part of your team? So what are the things that makes a recent graduate, someone who's an early career, someone who's mid career? How do people come together to create the kind of tactical learners that we were talking about, which in itself takes mental right. and yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, most most people know have practicing that the work we do is inherently collaborative uh, and interdisciplinary. Uh, you know, you don't get as much of that in school because you're trying to drill deep into your chosen discipline. But the second you get out there, you realize you only know like one portion of what there needs to be known in order to solve a problem. So I um, have built all of my teams to include, and the teams in Detroit included an architect, an urban designer, a city planner, a landscape architect, and the star preservationist. Those, that was the team. And you can imagine the conversations they would have every day as to how to solve a problem, right? Well, you know, the architect sees a vacant lot and they say, we should put a house there. And uh, the historic preservation said, why are you putting a new house there when there are houses to be rehabbed next door? Or why are you putting the landscape architect, why are you putting a house there? There could be a garden. <laughs> so, so you would have this ferment uh, that actually led to a very creative, some very innovative strategies. So I've come to really uh, believe that the answer resides at the intersection of all of these disciplines. And I have hired more architects to a planning department, uh, more landing, landscape architects to a planning department than I have traditionally seen. I was actually surprised that there are only like, you know, finance people and city planners working in the planning department. I thought, you know, well, you are dealing with the full spectrum of the built and natural environment. That's what should be reflected in how you build your, your teams. And uh, so I feel like I've found like the magic sauce there. Uh, and I have employed it again and again. Um, and uh, it seems to be producing a level of innovation uh, that has taught people's imagination. Let me be proud of that. Well, all of you have an opportunity to uh, continue the conversation with employees one on one or two or three or five on one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never gets the last word at the box. Welcome to. Let me talk about the